Welcome to Paria Magazine, where I chat with individuals who have a desire to create. Today, I am joined by a musician whose new show, Mystique, arrives in Sydney soon. Welcome to Paria Magazine, Michael Boyd. Thank you so much, and I'll correct you. It's magician, illusionist, not musician, very, very different crafts. One oh, makes did I say music. Music? I'm... Yeah, I just thought I'd correct everyone just in case they wonder what instrument I play. No, no, it's magic, sawing people in half and levitating people. <laughs> oh, I can see I do more mu music interviews than magicians, so you are a big standout for the, the, the channel. <laughs> Easy peasy. Uh, so we're here today to chat about your journey through the world of magic and your new show, Mystique. Before we dive into that, are you able to give our audience a quick little introduction as to who Michael is away from the stage? Who Michael is away from the stage is very different or a little bit different to who I am on stage. I'm actually a single sole parent father. I am, um, so I, I, I wear a lot of hats in the house. I'm running the whole household. I'm running a business. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I love my physical um, exercise and stuff, all the exercise classes. I do my daughter's um, AFL football team. I, um, I do the boundary umpire for her. So I, I'm a regular dad out of, um, out of the, the business. But when I'm on stage, there's lots of glitter and sequins and ladies levitating and lots of glamour. But at the end of the day, it's a job like everybody else and I'm making a living. I'm very lucky to be doing something that I love to make my living. And how did you discover that passion for magic and decide that this is something I want to pursue as a career? Well, when I started out as a kid, I remember I had the little light bulb trick or the light bulb moment, excuse me, I'll turn off my phone, uh, that used to light up. It was a little light bulb and you had a ring and it lit up. And I just had this passion for magic, this real interest for every magic kid, every show bag. And then I discovered that my grandfather was a, a magician in the 1920s and 30s. He toured with a half magic show, half silent movie show. So he became a hero. And um, I guess it's in the family blood. Uh, I just kept doing it. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's amazing what you can keep doing. And suddenly it becomes your job and your li living. And here I am years later, that's all I've done. All my life is magic. And how does your daughter feel about you being a magician? Magician. Why do I keep trying to say musician? Magician, illusionist is in the trade because I deal in, in big magic where ladies are levitating or cutting halves. She, as a child, she absolutely loved it uh, and uh, used to come around on the tours with me. Now she prefers to hang with her friends and somewhat ways probably prefers that dad had a normal job because I'm always on the road. So working out the logistics of, you know, grandma or grandpa is either coming to look after you at home, at our home in Melbourne, I live in Melbourne, or you can come on the road. And we, we've done both, but at this stage, she prefers to stay there. She loves it uh, secretly. She's very proud of me and um, her, her friends love it. I mean, what does your dad do? He's a, a magician. Really? Let me look him up on Instagram. Wow, he really is. Even the teachers at school love it. So they all, all follow me. So I think she thinks it's pretty cool. But there's a part of her that wishes... It was just normal dad who was a bank manager and was there every day because that's the hard part. There's lots of travel and there's lots of, uh, you know, moving around. That's just part of the job. Okay. And do you remember what the first magic trick you learned was? I do. I remember my grandfather had the old trick with the linking rings, the traditional, they call Chinese linking rings where they link and unlink. I remember seeing that trick and it was one that's really special to me because he taught it to me and it's quite a, a difficult illusion to perform. It takes a lot of practice. And we really bonded together over this trick, literally linked joining and unlinking rings. I had to learn the craft. So I still do that trick in my show and it has a really important uh, you know, uh, memory for me because I remember learning it as a kid and the skill it took and the practice and dropping the rings and making a big noise and then finally perfecting that illusion. And as I said, I still do it in the show. It still gets a great reaction. It's one of the first tricks I learned and I introduced that as, as the trick in the show and people still love it. Still a classic of magic. 
And then in terms of influences, was your grandfather obviously the first influence, but then how have those influences evolved over the years? Influence evolved, obviously, when you start seeing those big performers and international performers, you can't go past the David Copperfields and the previously Siegfried and Roy Lansbert and all the big Las Vegas magicians. Their flamboyance and the way they presented their illusions was really important to me. It showed me that it's not so much the magic trick, it's the presentation that you give it that gives it life and makes it really magical. There's only a small part of the secret which you learn and you practice perfect, but the showmanship is really what sells it. And that's where I learned it from those uh, big performers overseas. And how has it been sort of getting into that sort of big stage magic rather than the smaller intimate tricks? It's obviously a lot more difficult because it's a very niche market. It involves big props that are very expensive and then you have to cart these props around. So it's not really practical craft. Then you need a stage or an avenue to perform it. It's not something you can do in a living room. You really want a stage with lighting and all those things. But like anything, I followed my passion. I was persistent. It's what I wanted to do, always what I wanted to do. And eventually I made it work like anything. Perseverance is a huge thing. You just have to keep trying and going, well, how can I make that work? And where can I work it? And how can I get there? Starts with theatre restaurants. When I was younger, I worked in the theatre restaurants and then did the cabarets over in Asia and then started on the cruise ships, which was a huge market and then did casinos and basically have traveled the world doing the impossible, what you shouldn't be able to do, but I've made, I've made it work, I've made a living out of it. Wonderful. And that's all sort of led you into this new show, Mystique, which is coming to Sydney shortly. How are you feeling uh, ahead of the show? Look, I'm really excited because Mystique is the best of the best illusions that I have. I'm putting on the biggest, some of the biggest illusions I never perform. One of them being the giant scorpion, which was cost me over $50,000. It has all these bells and whistles. It's a massive electronic scorpion. I get locked inside and, and a blade descends into the box. I mean, you see my arms and legs and I have to escape. It is, uh, I like living on the edge uh, and I like that kind of adrenaline and rush, but I always worry with these things. It's technology and you push a button and maybe something's going to go wrong. It's not the magic that's going to go wrong, but technology fails. As we know, will that blade come crashing down in the box and chop me in two? Well, you'll have to come to the show and see. Hopefully there won't be, <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll be the way that it goes. So I really love that part. I also love adding new elements and we've got some fantastic new soundtracks and we're getting a new choreographer because there's lots of layers to the show. You know, there's comedy and dance routines, there's beautiful illusions, there's drama with those scary illusions and, and escapes. And there's also some really nice intimate moments where I get a volunteer on stage and, uh, you get to do the magic in front of them. And I think this resonates to the audience. They see the reaction of the volunteer. I um, react also to the reaction. It's always a new show with a volunteer. So there's so many different layers to the show that I really love. And I'm so looking forward to take it to the beautiful state theatre. What a perfect backdrop for a magic show. And with this being like your biggest show to date, is, is that exciting for you as well, I imagine? Absolutely. Um, there's always that element of exciting and bringing, uh, bringing together the new illusions and all the new cast and the rehearsals. And when you start seeing all those elements come together, the brand new costumes have had those tracks, I get excited. I'm still excited and passionate about my craft and taking it to new areas and making it into something new is always something that we want to do. I always like to evolve. I don't like to do what I did in the past. We got to reinvent it. We got to make it better. There's always room for improvement in any art, or always room to change it and evolve it. So that's current for this audience. And we're finding that they, at people are wanting magic more and more. I think with the way life is so complicated and so many things going on, just for a few hours to sit and escape into a world of magic, it really does take you away. You forget your problems. You forget everything that's going on on earth, and you just. What I love the best is seeing the parents and they look over to their kids and go, wow, and they're looking back, connecting with one another. And that's also important, the feeling of wonder that you're giving to both the children and then also to the parents or the adults around that are seeing this. Okay. 
And you mentioned playing the iconic State Theatre. Are there other Australian dream venues that you would love to take this show? I would love to take it to, uh, and I've been very, very fortunate to take it all across Australia. I guess my, I've, I've played in Melbourne at the Crown Casino and all the beautiful uh, Princess Theatre or Her Majesty's Theatres and all those theatres across Australia. I guess the next level for me would be to take, and it is very difficult with a big illusion show, take it overseas and take it to new new audiences. I have done Asia before, but I'd love to, a big dream of mine is to take it to Las Vegas mm -hmm. and be like my heroes perform in the, the big glittering strip. Yeah, I was in Las Vegas earlier this year and it's, it's an amazing place to be and so many magic shows around. So many magic shows and the bigger scale that they have over there, like nothing we've ever seen, the, the casino um, venues or showrooms are just incredible. And then once this uh, tour completes, what is on the horizon for you? Is it back to the drawing board to come up with new illusions or new tricks or is it on to international touring? It's back on the road for me. I have a, a tour that I do, a national tour with another show, which takes me through um, November and December. Uh, New Year's Eve, um, I'm looking at Singapore. There's some jobs over there for New Year's Eve. Then back to Australia to work on um, a Circus of Illusion, which is a show that combines two of my greatest passions, Circus Acts and Grand Illusions. So that's another family show. We're taking that back on the road and going to Canberra. And also Mystique, we want to take the magic of Mystique, we, we're bringing it down a little in scale, but taking it to country venues that have never seen it again, to small auditoriums. Uh, still a great, a great show, but obviously not the big massive illusions because they won't fit in those venues, but take it to regional centres to really, I guess it's following in my grandfather's footsteps and being on the road and taking a show to those regional venues where they've never seen anything like it especially after the last couple of years that we've had, it would be, they'd be very excited to have something like this come out to the regions. Absolutely. And, and I'm just as excited to take it there and see their reactions. And we're finding more and more the reactions are turned up. It's like turning up the dial. Alrighty. Wonderful. Finally, where is the best place for people to support you and track this creative journey moving forward? Best to um, look through the Facebook page, the Mystique Facebook page updates all of the uh, the shows that we have coming up, and um, and that's probably the best place to do it. We also have an Instagram there, and we've got some um, these new uh, social media is incredible platform to display magic. And recently we had a clip which was just one of the oldest tricks of the book with a magician is locked in the box and the assistant has the cloth and bang, they swap places in a split second. Well, this clip has got nearly 5 million views on this, uh, on one of the Instagram reels. It's amazing. I don't do that stuff. We have a social media manager, but I'm constantly amazed at bringing magic again to new audiences in relevant places. And it's great to see that people are still interested in magic. All right. That's awesome. Like, yeah, it's not necessarily the big crazy tricks that you expect to be the ones that catch on. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, it, you, you just never know. But it, it, the best thing is that audiences still want to see magic. They're still amazed by it. And, and, and they're still fascinated with all this technology going around. Magic is one of the oldest art forms in the world. And it's still relevant these days. And it's, um, yeah, simple trickery, but it's the presentation. Uh, that really makes it pop. Righty. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me and good luck with the shows. Yeah. Thank you so much. Be sure to come and see us at the State Theatre with Mystique. We'd love to see you there and see if that's sore, if I survived that sore. <laughs>